Hi, I'm John, the interest-free currency engineer Termel, and this is Venezuela Confronts Capitalism Crisis with More Revolution. Venezuela Confronts Capitalism's Crisis with More Revolution, March 28, 2009, by Manuel Sanchez, source Green Left Weekly. Uh, so, in some countries, the severe crisis of capitalism has resulted in a realignment of respective governments with the imperialist powers and the adoption of different forms of cutbacks that affect the living conditions of the majority. In Venezuela, the opposite is occurring. Before and after the victory of the pro-revolution forces in the referendum on February 15th to allow elected officials to stand for re-election more than once, the decision to push forward with the transition to socialism was ratified. The world economic situation has also undoubtedly hit hard in Venezuela. The revolutionary governments already resolved to, quote, eliminate all expenses that are not absolutely indispensable, unquote. Duh, you never thought of using bonds? Wow. But these austerity measures, far from adversely affecting the course of the revolution that seeks to transform the country, are favoring it. Crisis hastens radicalization. The opposite is occurring. The relative scarcity of resources caused by the abrupt drop in oil prices simply tightened the margin of concessions that the government has made in all areas to the coup plotting forces entrenched in key sectors of production and finance. In the final minutes of his January 13th speech, Chavez clarified there are prognoses coming from different quarters of the political opposition and some media outlets of an economic debacle in Venezuela. Moreover, the media is proclaiming that Chavez is preparing a neoliberal package. Instead, I want to repeat the following once again to the oligarchy and the Venezuelan bourgeoisie. They would be better off praying instead of asking and clamoring for a debacle to fall upon Venezuela. To the opposition, pray that the great world crisis of capitalism, the great world capitalist economic crisis, doesn't reach here with the intensity that you are wishing for. Why? Because Carlos Andres Perez, a former social democratic president who in 1989 implemented harsh, anti-poor, neoliberal policies that resulted in the Caracazo uprising, is not the person heading this government Hugo Chavez is. Look, if they're thinking that I'm going to follow the policies of Carlos Andres Perez or that of George Bush now over the last few months of bailing out with thousands of millions of dollars, as was previously done here, to this financial oligarchy, this unpatriotic bourgeoisie, they're very mistaken. Giving the cash to the poor, not the Obama way, giving it to the rich. If the impact of the economic crisis of world capitalism reaches here with force, it is those sectors of national capitalism that are going to be hit hard. It won't be the people. It will not be the revolution. The opposition played deaf. Beginning with the unaltered pressure they received from the U.S. and their erroneous characterization regarding the referendum, they have prolonged their favorite tactic for wearing down the government following their February 15 defeat. Food shortages and price increases. Hit the poor where it hurts, make them revolt, eh? The historic plan. Parallel to this, opposition groups are fanning the flames of a plan to convert the opposition-governed states of Tachira and Zulia into territories out of control of the central government, fomenting a separatist structure. In other words, the United States is fomenting a civil war. With this separatist strategy, they are feeding the idea of sowing civil war in Tachira, Zulia, Barinas, and Merida, explained the co-pro-government DROV on February 25th. And isn't it too bad they just couldn't let them go and then be on their own poverty while the ones, other ones get rich? Of course, that wouldn't be helping the poor people in those places, right? On the afternoon of February 28th, Chavez responded by announcing the government takeover of the rice plants that had been violating price controls. There are sectors of agro-industry that are refusing to obey laws, above all, those that process rice. I have ordered that they be intervened starting now. To remove any doubt, the President instructed the Commander of the National Guard, Major General Freddy Alonso Carrion, to guarantee the support needed to take over these rice factories, together with the Agricultural Minister and Head of the Strategic Operation Command, Major General Jesus Gonzalez Gonzalez. We will not allow them to continue poking fun at the people and the revolutionary government, said Chavez during his national announcement broadcast on radio and television. They are threatening to halt production. If they do that, I will expropriate them. 
I have no problem with that, and I'll pay them with bonds. Yes! That's the way to do it right. Don't count on me paying with hard cash, added Chavez. Hey, bonds are as good. They're the backup for the cash you can borrow from a bank anyway. Barely hours later, the Vice Minister of Agriculture, Richard Cannon, confirmed in front of state TV cameras the takeover of the installations of Arras Primor, which belongs to the Polar Company. Right now, we are initiating a process of temporary occupation of the Arras Primor Company here in Calabozo, declared Cannon. He explained that the installations have a capacity to process more than 7,500 tons per month, but that it is processing less than 3,000 tons while people are hungry. You know, pure flavored rice, he underlined, which is more expensive as it avoids the price control set by the government for ordinary rice. Combating sabotage and crisis, although undoubtedly the political impact of a referendum victory made against an intense opposition campaign for a no vote outweighs these measures as expected as they were controversial. The takeovers can be understood in light of the world crisis. For at least six years, the government has had to counteract food shortages and disruptions with the massive purchasing of food imports, while undertaking the laborious and slow process of increasing internal production, which is now considerably advanced. However, this was only possible with money available from overpriced oil sales in the last period. With this extraordinary surplus cut down, the government's response has come. One year ago, when the revolution suffered a setback with the defeat of the 2007 referendum to reform the Constitution, and an emboldened opposition sought to worsen food shortages, opposition-aligned large food producers and distributors had manufactured in the lead-up to the referendum, it was clear that the continuation of the revolution required the revolutionary forces to have direct control over key centers on food production, importation, and distribution. That is a sector that, together with some private banks, still maintains the capacity to control the quantity, quality, and price of primary food staples for the population. And that's real control. In apparent contradiction with the relationship of forces at that stage, some voices began to raise the forbidden word, expropriation. Well, for bonds, that's fair. Chavez advanced step by step continuing the program of nationalization begun in 2007 that involved nationalizations in the electrical and telecommunications sectors. In 2008, his government expropriated giant Cedar Steel Company, cement companies, and the Bank of Venezuela. Wow, you mean they got the bank? Now they got to learn to run it right, upgrade the software. Now, in the wake of the nationalization flurry in the imperialist nations, in order to combat the economic crisis, one of the biggest confusions raised in the course of the Bolivarian Revolution has been cleared up, that of equating nationalisms with socialism. Moreover, Chavez paid compensation for those expropriations. It is possible to imagine the shock waves that went through the managers of the expropriated companies that had not finalized these transactions in light of Chavez's allusions to paying in bonds. Arguments criticizing the pace of nationalizations were made by certain sectors of the left who deny the existence of a strategy of transition towards socialism in Venezuela. Sectors of the bourgeoisie acted on the same premise, thinking they could continue pulling the strings. Here is the result. In perfect continuity, but presumably at a speed uniformly accelerated by the pressure of the world crisis, Venezuela continues down the path of the transition to socialism, advancing to socialism. Five days after the referendum victory, Chavez insisted on some key concepts. For there to be socialism, we have to transform Venezuela's economic structures. We have to work towards social property of the means of production, which will allow us to generate the conditions required to achieve social justice. For there to be no misery, poverty, or crimes in Venezuela, adding socialism is scientific or it is nothing. Well, actually, all you got to do is fix the shortage of chips and everything works fine, whether it's socialism or capitalism. So, socialism cannot be just simply a dream, a hope, a sentiment, Chavez argued. Socialism needs to have real body, muscle, skeleton, nerve system, meat, life, hardware, and software. We have to transform the economic model, basing it on social property over land, industry, the means of production. This is part of life or death, of the hope that the Bolivarian Revolution will not fail. We cannot fail again. So we did not get to where we are to make small reforms. We are here to deeply transform the social, political, and economic structures. In his message to the nation, the president has also warned, there are countries that pride themselves on economic growth. What a surprise! But at the same time that gross domestic product grows, so does poverty. Well, let's face it, Goldman Sachs made $500 billion. America lost $490 billion. They're up 10 
Not here. Here the country is growing economically under its own sovereign model, and moreover with the reduction of poverty, of exclusion, of marginality, and improvements in living conditions. The world economic crisis, explained Chavez, will of course also affect Venezuela. But at the same time as the Minister of Economy, Ali Rodriguez, ordered the elimination of all expenses that are not absolutely indispensable, Chavez made clear that the budget for the poor, pro-poor social missions will not be cut. The missions are sacred. They are the lifeblood of the people. Food, education, health, housing, culture, ecology. We will continue investing the necessary resources. Nothing new except that the money that is no longer coming from oil will be sought by the revolution from the sources where it is. Why? You can't produce your own? You gotta go find it elsewhere?